faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And will, to the best of your ability, and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. If a free society cannot help the many who are poor, it cannot save the few who are rich. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. We tend to see John Kennedy as youthful, glamorous, and vaguely progressive. But the day he died, we lost an invaluable treasure. We lost a man of peace who tried to get the American people to see our Cold War enemies not as despicable and human monsters, but as people like us. No government or social system is so evil that its people must be considered as lacking in virtue. But we can still hail the Russian people for their many achievements in science and space, in economic and industrial growth, in culture, in acts of courage. Our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's futures. And we are all mortal. We lost a populist, a president for all the people. Harry Truman once said there are 14 or 15 million Americans who have the resources to have representatives in Washington to protect their interests. And that the interests of the great mass of the other people, the 150 or 60 million, is the responsibility of the President of the United States, and I propose to fulfill it. Imagine a President going after the oil companies like John Kennedy went after the steel companies in 1962. The simultaneous and identical actions of United States Steel and other leading steel corporations increasing steel prices by some six dollars a ton constitute a wholly unjustifiable and irresponsible defiance of the public interest. We lost a visionary who recognized the need for radical social change. Those who make peaceful revolution impossible will make violent revolution inevitable. And, though you're probably not aware, you lost the man who saved your life on October 17, 1962. U.S. spy planes had photographed Russian missiles in Cuba capable of hitting Washington and the entire East Coast. Kennedy announced a blockade of Cuba. This government, as promised, has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. Within the past week, unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. And Kennedy's generals and advisors were telling him that he and they should slip away to the safety of bomb shelters, attack the missile sites, and then launch a full-scale invasion of Cuba. They assured Kennedy that the Russian missiles were not ready, but that they should all go to bomb shelters anyway, just to be safe. Kennedy thought about it, and then he told them that nobody was going anywhere, that if anyone died, they would be the first to go, sitting as they were in the White House, the prime target of those Russian missiles. And Kennedy suggested that, with this new perspective, they should all work out another, safer plan. It turns out that the generals were wrong. The Russian missiles were not only ready, they were armed with nuclear warheads which the local commanders were authorized to use if attacked. Kennedy saved the world and you from nuclear holocaust that day, a holocaust that almost certainly would have killed everyone in the northern hemisphere. Eisenhower warned us that the greatest threat to American security came from the military-industrial complex. And Kennedy heard him. And then he called on the world to strengthen the United Nations organization, to help them not just to rein in the military-industrial complex, but to eliminate it completely. Before he died, Kennedy told the United Nations, For in the development of this organization rests the only true alternative to war, and war appeals no longer as a rational alternative. For a nuclear disaster spread by wind and water and fear 
could well engulf the great and the small, the rich and the poor, the committed and the uncommitted alike. Mankind must put an end to war, or war will put an end to mankind. It is therefore our intention to challenge the Soviet Union, not to an arms race, but to a peace race, to advance together, step by step, stage by stage, until general and complete disarmament has been achieved under the eyes of an international disarmament organization, a steady reduction in force, both nuclear and conventional, until it has abolished all armies and all weapons, except those needed for internal order and a new United Nations Peace Force. And it starts that process now, today, even as the talks begin. Never have the nations of the world had so much to lose or so much to gain. Together we shall save our planet or together we shall perish in its flames. What a terrible crime and what a terrible loss to lose this man. And as we should be, the world is still haunted by our failure to act. Emancipate yourselves from mental slavery None but ourselves can free our mind Oh, have no fear for atomic energy Cause none of them are gonna stop at the time How long shall they kill our prophets While we stand aside and look Yes, some say it's just a part of it We've got to fulfill the book Won't you hear to sing These songs of freedom Cause all I ever had Redemption songs All I On November 22, 1963, the day he was shot, John Kennedy also lost a lot of things. He lost his beautiful wife. He left without saying goodbye to his lovely children. And although we don't think about it much, he lost the ability to have any effect on what the history books would say about him. Napoleon said that history is written by the winners, but I don't think we really appreciate what that means. If I'm rich and powerful, and my thugs murder you and wipe out your family and all your friends and all of the witnesses, I am going to have much more to say about your history when it is written than you are. The killers get to write history, the victims get written about. And with his murder, John Kennedy lost the ability to have any effect on what the history books would say about him. He became one of the victims who get written about. I wonder what he would say about his killers if he could speak. The most shocking thing about the assassination is not the brutality of it. It was brutal, certainly. But the most amazing thing is the way the established media today managed to pretend that there is any question of whether his murder was a conspiracy. We need to understand the images we've been looking at. This is Dealey Plaza, the scene of the crime. This is the school book depository building and the sixth floor window from which Oswald supposedly did his shooting. Abraham Zapruder was standing here with his home movie camera when he took the graphic pictures you just saw of the assassination, the Zapruder film. And this is the so-called grassy knoll. We'll talk more about that in a minute. The official government version of the murder, the Warren Commission report, found that Lee Harvey Oswald fired three shots from the sixth floor of the Dallas School Book Depository building. They tell us that the first shot missed, that the second shot hit both Kennedy and the governor of Texas, and that the third shot, from behind, 
hit Kennedy in the head and killed him. But it's hard to watch the Zapruder film of Kennedy being thrown violently backward into the left and not think that he was shot from the front. This is Dr. Cyril Wecht. As the former head of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, he is the expert elected by the experts to represent them. If you have that kind of force slamming into the rear of somebody's head, then that should drive the individual forward. But instead, we have him moving backward and to the left. That suggests the very distinct possibility of another shot having been fired in synchronized fashion from the right side, the so-called grassy knoll area. But he's not the only one who thinks there was a shot fired from the grassy knoll. These people are standing in front of the grassy knoll, and they are ducking because they heard a shot fired over their heads. The people you see running are running toward the grassy knoll, heroically trying to catch the assassins. If Kennedy had actually been shot from behind, as the government says, he ought to have a small entrance wound on the back of his head. And this is the Navy doctor that the government got to write this report, saying that Kennedy did have this small wound in the back of his head. But there are some things you should know about this doctor. In a standard examination, he should have examined Kennedy's clothing for bullet holes. He didn't. In a standard autopsy, he should have dissected all of Kennedy's wounds to trace the bullet's path. He didn't dissect any of Kennedy's wounds. He didn't even realize that Kennedy had a throat wound. He later claimed that these drawings of his were wrong and that the wounds were actually much higher. He lost Kennedy's brain, which is still missing. And then he burned his notes. He burned his notes. But perhaps we shouldn't be too hard on him. Because this doctor, James Humes, had never done an autopsy involving gunshot wounds before in his life. So naturally, he was the government's first choice to perform the most important autopsy in American history. Dr. Hume's story about a small entrance wound on the back of Kennedy's head is today the official government version. But this is not the story that the New York Times told on the day that Kennedy died. On the left in this picture, we see the renowned New York Times reporter Tom Weicker in Dallas outside Parkland Hospital. He spoke to the doctors who had been called to the emergency room to treat the president, and his story later appeared the same day on the front page. His article states, Later in the afternoon, Dr. Malcolm Perry, an attending surgeon, and Dr. Kemp Clark, chief of neurosurgery at Parkland Hospital, gave more details. Mr. Kennedy was hit in the throat just below the Adam's apple, they said. This wound had the appearance of a bullet's entry. Entry wounds on the front. Mr. Kennedy also had a massive gaping wound in the back and one on the right side of the head. The wound on the right was the entry for the shot from the grassy knoll. The wound in the back was the exit for that bullet that sent Kennedy's brains flying. The Dallas emergency room doctors have been unanimous in describing a large exit wound in the back of Kennedy's head. I was probably looking into a wound that was on the lateral or the side part of the head and the back part of the head. It would be this portion of the head right here. Remember, it's like this, that there was a big wound, big deficit in his skull and the temporal parietal area. If you listen carefully, you will even hear Walter Cronkite admit that the autopsy photos show this large hole in the back of Kennedy's head. The drawing was approved by Dr. McClellan, one of the attending physicians in Dallas. The drawing suggests what many of the photos examined by the doctors in Nova show a large wound about this size and location. There is really no room for debate on this point. Kennedy had a huge exit wound in the back of his head because the shot that killed him came from the front and could not have been fired by Oswald, who was behind the president. This information did not start off as a secret. It was made into a secret by the constant authoritative denial of the truth. The lying continues today. Good evening, I'm Peter Jennings. Forty years after the assassination, the latest ABC News poll tells us that more than two-thirds of Americans still believe there was a conspiracy to kill the president. Forty years later, Jennings thought he was the man to fix this problem, that two-thirds of the American people believe the conspiracy theories that say the government is lying. What we will do tonight is demonstrate that those theories are wrong. Of course, he will have to lie to do that. This is Malcolm Kildiff. Kennedy's assistant press secretary. He is speaking at a press conference at the Dallas hospital where the president has just been pronounced dead. 
Please notice the ABC logo. This is from Jennings' video. He died of a gunshot wound in the brain. And they fade the scene out. No more press conference. But now watch this. The same press secretary, the same press conference, no ABC logo. Hello, Kennedy. Died at approximately 1 o'clock Central Standard Time today here in Dallas. He died of a gunshot wound in the brain. Dr. Berkeley told me it's a, a simple matter, Tom, of, uh, of a bullet right through the head. The press secretary tried to show us how the head wound was inflicted, but Jennings cut that out because it destroys the lie that he was trying to tell. Jennings also attacks the movie JFK for misleading people, to make them think that there was a shot from the front. This is the key shot. The president going back and to his left. Shot from the front and right. Back and to the left. Back and to the left. Back and to the left. So, how did Jennings refute this powerful evidence? He didn't even try, really. Back and to the left in no way indicates where a bullet came from. One of the leading forensic scientists in America says that the film shows the very distinct possibility of another shot having been fired in synchronized fashion from the right side, the so-called grassy knoll area. But we're just supposed to take Jennings' word for it. This sort of take my word for it is standard operating procedure for news people like Jennings. In all these years, there has not been a single piece of credible evidence to prove a conspiracy. In fact, 100% of the medical personnel in Dallas who saw the president's wounds described a large exit wound in the back of the head about this size and location. Virtually all the witnesses near the grassy knoll say they heard a shot from that direction, and dozens of them chased after the gunman who fired that shot. Congress hired acoustic experts to analyze the sounds of a tape recording of the assassination. Their report was decisive and powerful. The probability of 95% or better, there was indeed a shot fired from the grassy knoll. And Jennings' response to this mountain of proof is... All these years, there has not been a single piece of credible evidence to prove a conspiracy. Now there's a problem here. Jennings was a newsman. If people were to come to see him as a crude liar, his career as a newsman would be finished. Why would he risk everything telling such weak and obvious lies about a murder that took place 40 years ago? The people who killed the president and got away with it 40 years ago were obviously very powerful then. Are some of the killers still alive? Are they still so powerful that they can force a leading newsman like Jennings to lie to protect them? Apparently, the ones who are still alive are still very powerful people. Your name is the brother. You've killed all our leaders. I don't even have to do nothing to you. You cause your own country to fall. Can we help to give John Kennedy a voice to write his history as he would have written it? I think we owe it to him to try. And certainly, he deserves better than the fairy tale put forward by the government and commonly referred to as the single bullet theory. The FBI and Warren Commission concluded that Oswald, or anyone else shooting with this rifle, could only have fired three shots in the six seconds during which the shooting took place. Since the first shot missed, that means, except for Kennedy's head wound, all the other wounds to Kennedy and all the wounds to Governor Connolly sitting in front of him had to have been caused by a single bullet. This anti-conspiracy theory, that there was only one shooter, is completely dependent upon this single bullet theory. The anti-conspiracy theory says that this single bullet entered the president's back headed downward at an angle of 17 degrees. Then, while inside the president's body, the bullet reversed direction and moved upward, necessarily piercing and exiting Kennedy's spine, a major bone structure, in order to leave the president's body from the front of his neck. According to the official theory, the bullet then waited 1.6 seconds, presumably in midair, before turning right, and then left, 
The bullet then headed downward, now at an angle of 27 degrees, shattering Connolly's fifth rib and exiting from the same side of his chest. The bullet then turned right again and struck Governor Connolly in his right wrist, shattering the radius bone. The bullet then exited Connolly's wrist, made a dramatic left turn, and buried itself into Connolly's left thigh, from which, according to the official theory, it later fell out and was found in absolutely perfect condition, without a trace of blood on it, in a corner of Dallas's Parkland Hospital, on a stretcher not in any way connected with the case. The bullet was found here in this area, and not on that stretcher. That's the stretcher I took off the elbow. It was there when I came up. That is some bullet, with even more magical qualities. You see, substantial bullet fragments were recovered from Connolly's leg and wrist. These are the fragments from his wrist. But the bullet that was found on the hospital stretcher was completely undamaged and was not missing any fragments. But we're not done with this bullet yet. You remember Dr. Wecht. At the National Archives in Washington, Dr. Cyril Wecht, former head of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, examined bullets the Warren Commission had test fired. To find out if a bullet could break so many bones and remain apparently intact, the Commission used a rifle similar to Oswald's. And then they got these bullets, all 6.5 millimeter. And they test fired first into cotton wadding. These two bullets were fired into cotton wadding, striking nothing. You will note that these bullets both have a minimal degree of protrusion of the lead at the base. Otherwise, they are intact, which is what you would expect. The next bullet broke one rib of a goat carcass. Notice, please, it's widening. This bullet struck one of the two large bones that come down from the elbow to the wrist in a human cadaver. They wanted to simulate the fracture of that same bone in Governor Conley. Please note the substantial deformity. This is classical, typical, when a bullet strikes a dense, heavy bone or some other very firm object. Now, I want you to look at the so-called stretcher bullet. This bullet is the actual bullet that the Warren Commission claims broke both John Connolly's right fifth rib, destroying four inches of that bone, pulverizing it, and which caused a comminuted or extensively fragmented fracture of a dense heavy bone down near the base uh, of the wrist and emerged in this condition. You will see that it is near pristine. As a matter of fact, its nose, the cone, the sides of the bullet are completely intact and unscathed. It has only minimal protrusion of the lead core at the base in the same fashion that the two bullets did that had been fired in the test wadding. That's from the impact of the firing mechanism. Without this single bullet explanation, the government can't possibly explain how one lone assassin could have caused all these wounds. But once you conclude that no single bullet could have created all these wounds, you have to conclude that there was at least a fourth shot. But Oswald could not possibly have fired that fourth shot. So that means a second rifle. And if there was a second rifleman, then by definition, there had to have been a conspiracy. Now, you're all familiar with this word. We've had it rammed down our throats for 40 years. Conspiracy theories are for nuts, right? But in this case, if you continue to deny reality, to insist that there was no conspiracy, wouldn't that make you a nut who refuses to see reality? The murder of John F. Kennedy presents us with a world of opposites, a looking glass world in which black is white, and virtually everything is the opposite of what we have been taught to believe. Let's try this. Let's try thinking differently. We were told that one bullet made all of these wounds. And what's the opposite of that? The opposite would be that every wound was made by a different bullet. Let's count them. Kennedy's back, one. Kennedy's throat, two. Kennedy's head, three. Connolly's ribs, four. Connolly's wrist, five. Connolly's leg, six. Since we're counting bullets, remember that even the government admits that the first shot missed. So let's add one more. The first shot missed. Seven. Photographs show, and four witnesses have said, that there was a bullet hole in the windshield. 
The witnesses include a doctor. But it was very clear. It was a through and through bullet hole through the windshield of the car from the front to the back. A Secret Service agent's report and the supervisor of the men who repaired the windshield. It was a good, clean bullet hole right straight through yeah. the front. Right. This had a clean round hole in the front and fragmentized the front of that. Photographs also show a bullet hole in the convertible roof frame over the windshield. James Tague was nicked by a bullet fragment while standing near the triple underpass. And several witnesses, including two police officers, reported seeing bullets impact the street, the curb, the sidewalk, and the grass. Now, we don't want to exaggerate. It's very possible that the first shot, the shot that missed, impacted the grass, or the curb, or the street, or hit the limousine here. But it is at least as likely that even more shots were fired in synchronized fashion by multiple shooters, but that no one saw where these bullets hit. We are told that Oswald acted alone. And what's the opposite of that? This hail of bullets was fired by at least three teams of shooters, a small army, including spotters, as many as 13 people. We are told that Kennedy was the most powerful man in the world, brought down by a powerless, minimum wage nobody. And what's the opposite of that? And what does it look like? when real power kills. Ordinarily, a unit of military, I think was called a special group number 113, would have come up from San Antonio, Texas, and would have been deployed all through the streets of Dallas, the important streets of Dallas. That was not done. In fact, the commander was specifically told he wasn't needed. Secret Service regulations require that any time the president's car slows down below 44 miles per hour, the security must be poured on. You've all seen the picture of the school book building, you know, where Oswald is supposed to have shot the president. You notice in those pictures there are open windows. If the Secret Service had been there and had done their usual job, none of those windows would have been open. And had anyone opened one of those windows at that time, they would have been on the radio, they would have had a man in that room immediately, and the window would have been closed. You see, that's protection. That didn't take place. In fact, there were no Secret Service people on the ground around Dealey Plaza that afternoon. They were told they were not needed. Instead, as the president's limousine slowed to execute a hairpin turn into the killing zone, not only had the support from the Army been canceled, but... A careful examination of where all of the Secret Service agents were that day uh, and their duty assignments indicates that no Secret Service agent was in that area. What are we looking at here? Handles. On the back of the president's limousine? Why? Normally in a motorcade, Secret Service agents would be riding on the back of his car and run along beside him whenever the car slowed down. In Dallas, these agents were ordered to abandon their positions. They didn't agree with it, they didn't like it, but they followed their orders. Normally there would be four motorcycles on each side of the president's limousine. This is what the Dallas police prepared for. However, all of the motorcycle police were removed from escorting the president. Two were placed on each side of the car containing the Secret Service agents, and the rest were moved to the back of the parade. I was president. I get elected on Friday. Assassinated on Saturday. Look at the people in these crowds. They are four and five deep in some places. Just before the last turn in the motorcade, we can see that people are still standing five deep to see the president. But then, the limousine turns the corner, drives 100 yards, and... What happened? Where are all the people? The killers were able to nearly completely eliminate the witnesses to their crime by excluding them from Dealey Plaza. They controlled the murder scene. They made sure that... No Secret Service agent was in that area except for the small army of their people running around with Secret Service credentials and machine guns. When I got here, I was stopped by a uh, person in a suit with an overcoat over his arm, throw it over his arm, also had a gun under his arm. It looked like a little machine gun to me, a small machine gun. Tell them the truth, the truth. Tell them about JFK. So, they failed to provide Kennedy with the protection necessary to make sure that all the windows were closed in Dealey Plaza. They failed to provide him with Secret Service men on the back or on the sides of his limousine. 
they failed to provide him with a protective motorcycle escort. However, they did provide Kennedy with a driver who, film shows, was breaking until after the fatal shot to the president. In these frames, close to 12 shots have been fired. The president and Governor Connolly already have five wounds between them. There's a hole in the middle of the windshield, and the driver is braking at 12 miles per hour. But watch this. Again, look at the driver. What is he doing? His training says that he should be speeding away from the scene. His partner is supposed to have jumped in the back seat, thrown the president to the floor, and jumped on top of him to shield him. But in this frame, they are both completely turned around, watching the president die. Why? What possible explanation is there for this extraordinary behavior? It is not until the driver sees the president receive the fatal shot to the head that he finally turns around and drives off at top speed. Now, you can invent an explanation for this behavior if you choose to. But then you have to invent an explanation for why this man was never questioned by the investigators about his most unusual behavior. The most obvious explanation is that this man was part of a conspiracy, that his job was to keep the president in the line of fire until he was dead. Certainly, that's the job that he performed. If I was president, if I was president, a whole man told me instead of spinning billions on the wall, we can do some of that money. In the first minutes after the assassination, the true story went out about the fatal shot from the front. But, as the hours went by, invisible forces began to black out the truth, take control of the story, and the language that could be used to discuss the assassination. Their words, their versions of events, went out steadily and unstoppably and penetrated deep into the killer's well-oiled propaganda machine. At 5.10 on the afternoon of the murder, the code word slump, the official lie, first appears, this time on the death certificate. Minutes later, while Governor Connolly is lying in his hospital bed, he repeats the code word that the killers have decided to use to describe the president as he was shot. I turned to look in the back seat, the president had slumped. Uh, he had said nothing. Slumped? The dictionary defines slump as to drop, collapse, or fall down. Connolly saw the president choking on a bullet in his throat, but he didn't see him slump until after he saw him thrown violently backward as his brains were blown out. This exact same, peculiarly inaccurate choice of words shows up everywhere. Not only on the death certificate, but in newspapers and magazines, and 45 years later, you can find it in the most popular high school history book in the country. But let's wait one minute here to take a second careful look at the man who was chosen by the killers to ride in the car directly in front of the president. Apparently, on the day of the murder, the killers were primarily concerned with overriding the accounts of the numerous witnesses who said that the president's brains had been blown out the back of the limousine by a shot from the front. So, the official story on the day of the murder was that there were three shots, that the first one hit Kennedy in the back, the second hit Connolly, and the third hit the president in the head, and he slumped. And this is the version of events that the governor is supporting here. He had just turned the corner. We heard a shot. I turned to look in the back seat. The president had slumped. Uh, he had said nothing. Almost simultaneously, as I turned, I was hit. And I knew I'd been hit badly. But later, the Warren Commission looked at the Zapruder film and saw clearly that the first shot had missed, and they came up with the ridiculous single bullet theory. But if Connolly and Kennedy had been hit by the same bullet, Connolly could not have looked in the back seat and seen that the president had been hit before he was hit, and so it was necessary for Connolly to change his story, and he did. Unquestionably, when the first shot was fired, I recognized it as a shot. I thought of nothing else but that it was a rifle shot. Uh, I turned to my right. I had time to think. I had time to react. And I turned to my right to look back over my right shoulder to see if I could see anything unusual and particularly to see if I could catch the president out of the corner of my eye because I immediately thought of an assassination attempt the moment I heard the shot. I didn't see anything except just the general blur of waving of, of people moving. Nothing really unusual. Uh, I did not see the president out of the corner of my eye and I was in the process. 
needed Connolly to say he saw the president slump, then that's what he said he saw. When they later needed him not to have seen the president slump before he was hit, then he didn't see him. It certainly appears that Connolly is a tool of the killers, doesn't it? We'll come back to him when it's time to start naming names, but until then, don't forget John Connolly. If Kennedy was surrounded by enemies at the last moments of his life, at the moment of his death, they literally swarmed over his body. President Kennedy was murdered in Dallas. The murder investigation, including the autopsy, should by law have taken place in Dallas. But we saw that Kennedy's official government autopsy was performed, instead, at the Bethesda Navy Hospital near Washington, D.C., by an amateur who didn't probe any of the wounds, who somehow didn't even see the enormous exit wound that all the doctors in Dallas saw, and who burned his notes when he was done. But how did this happen? Why wasn't legal procedure followed? Why didn't the autopsy take place in Dallas? How did it happen that normal procedures were abrogated, usurped by this bastard of an autopsy? These are important, natural, logical questions. And the answer is an interesting and significant story. It so happens that, shortly after the President's death, the Secret Service agents were trying, illegally, to leave Parkland Hospital with the casket containing Kennedy's body when Dr. Earl Rose, the Dallas coroner, tried to stop them. He said that Texas law required that the body remain in his custody until he could perform an autopsy. The agents pulled out their weapons. They pushed Dr. Rose out of the way, and they headed for the airport. Did the Mafia order them to do this as part of their plan to cover up their role in the assassination? Was it the Russians who concocted this plan? Maybe the Cubans? We're going to ask it again, but it's a central question and bears repeating. Who had the power to order the Secret Service to violate the law in this way? Think about it. In the meantime, prepare yourself for a shock. Because, after the Secret Service stole Kennedy's body from the Dallas coroner and loaded it onto Air Force One, what happened next is difficult to believe. David Lifton has done an extensive examination of this time period between when the body was loaded onto the plane and when it arrived in Washington for the autopsy. Lifton first noticed that the doctors who received the body for the autopsy in Washington reported seeing wounds that looked very different from the wounds described by the doctors in the Dallas emergency room. Why, he wondered, would the wounds appear so differently in Washington than they did in Dallas? Was it just that the doctors in Washington were lying? Or had the wounds somehow changed during the trip to Washington? He then found this report, written by two FBI agents present at the autopsy. The report says that... It was apparent that surgery of the head area was done before the autopsy started. What? It was apparent that surgery of the head area was done before the autopsy started. Someone casually walked up to Kennedy's casket, got out a knife, and began cutting on the president's head? But the Secret Service was all over the president's casket. How could this have happened? You asked, and I warned you. Lifton spent his life researching this question and he found the answer. What is very clear is that the president's body did not make an uninterrupted journey from Dallas to Bethesda. It began in a large ceremonial casket. It was placed in that casket by Aubrey Reich of the O'Neill Funeral Home. I helped put President Kennedy's body in a bronze ceremonial casket on November 22nd, 1963 at Parker Memorial Hospital. He wrapped the body in sheets. It was placed in the casket. The bronze casket was placed on board Air Force One. This was not the casket from which Kennedy's body was removed by Bethesda autopsy technician Paul O'Connor. We opened the pinkish gray uh, shipping casket and there was a gray body bag zip, yeah. zip shut. We unzipped the body bag and the president's body was lifted out of the, of the body bag. Reich told Lifton that Kennedy's body was not in a body bag when it left Dallas. How could he be so certain? I remember picking him up. I, I was one that, that had the blood on my shirt and everything from the, the body. If he'd been in a crash bag, you couldn't have got any blood on him because it's a sealed bag. Now, there were not a dozen men working at Parkland Hospital whose job was to put bodies into caskets. There was one. 
There were a couple of men at Bethesda who unloaded the president's body, and Paul O'Connor was one. These two men are the best witnesses available who could answer the question. Their word has to be considered the best evidence. No other credible witness has ever contradicted their testimony on the subject. So, if you have any respect for the evidence, as sad a story as it is to tell, it seems that while the president's brother and widow were keeping a sad watch over an empty casket, somehow someone performed the grisly task of changing the wounds on the front of the president's body. The reason for altering the body is that the body is the diagram of the shooting, and it's the most important evidence in the case. Someone wants to make it appear in the evidence that President Kennedy was struck twice from behind from the direction of the school book depository building and to obliterate any evidence of frontal entry. That's my opinion about what these facts mean. These are incredibly serious charges with absolutely enormous implications. These charges are not believable, are they? I mean, how could the president's body possibly have gotten from one casket into another? Are we supposed to believe that a couple of criminals just walked up to the casket in front of all those Secret Service men with all those guns and walked out with the body? Ridiculous, no? Okay, the FBI memo is powerful evidence, but the agent who wrote this must have made a mistake. Can we verify, can we corroborate what the memo says about apparent surgery? Maybe the photos taken at Bethesda before the autopsy started will show the surgery referred to in this memo. Clearly, the FBI agents were not referring to the left side of the president's head. If there's any surgery here, it is certainly not apparent. But now look at this autopsy photo of the right side of Kennedy's head. So, what do you think? Do you see what the FBI agents saw? Do you see apparent surgery in this photo? Well, you're no expert. But this is certainly what any amateur might call apparent surgery. In fact, it doesn't look like a bullet wound at all. It looks like some Boy Scout got out his pocket knife and crudely cut a V in the president's scalp and then ripped the skin back. But why? Looking at a black and white version, it is possible to see a probable bullet hole here. This is also, by the way, where the president's press secretary said that the president was shot. So we have strong reason to believe that there is an entrance wound on this part of the president's head and that the surgery we see here was an attempt, as Lipton says, to obliterate any evidence of frontal entry. There's a critical point that needs to be stressed about this photograph. Immediately after Paul O'Connor unzipped the body bag and removed the president's body from the shipping casket, he placed the president's body on an examination table to be photographed, as is routine to create a record of what the body looked like before the autopsy. And this picture was taken at that time before Dr. Humes began cutting the body up as part of the autopsy. So this photo ought to show the president's head in exactly the same condition as it was when it left Dallas. Does it? Was the crude cutting and ripping we see here done in Dallas, or did it somehow mysteriously appear somewhere on the road to Washington? This is an absolutely critical question. 25 years after the assassination, the people at Nova got the bright idea to find the Dallas physicians who examined Kennedy in the emergency room in Parkland Hospital and fly them into Washington to the National Archives to take a look at these photos taken immediately after Kennedy's body arrived in Washington, but before the autopsy began. They are going to answer this question for us. Do the photos taken before the autopsy show the body as they left it? Or did someone somehow informally and illegally cut slices into the president's head? I, I would have to say, uh, honestly, in looking at these photos, they're pretty much as I remember President Kennedy at the time, except for that little incision that seems to be coming down in the parietal area. He's telling us that Kennedy's head wound was altered. I could envision that an incision might have been made in order to pull the scalp back to expose this bone. As outrageous as it seems to be saying so, if we're going to be fair, if we're going to honor the evidence and go where it takes us, that would seem to settle the question. We have the FBI memo, expert eyewitness testimony, and the photo itself taken before the autopsy started, all showing this crude cutting and ripping in this critical area of the fatal shot. Someone operated on this wound to Kennedy's right temple 
the entrance for the bullet that went right through the head and blew out the back of Kennedy's skull. But how? How did the monsters who did this cutting and ripping get access to the body? And when? And where? And who done it? An Air Force officer claims the body could not have been switched because the casket was in his view for all but five minutes of the journey from Dallas to Bethesda. Well, there you go. While everyone on Air Force One was gathered in the front of the plane for five minutes watching President Johnson being sworn in, for example, the agents of evil snatched the body out of the casket and snuck it off the plane. But you know, it doesn't really matter when and where and how it was done. What matters is who. Who could have done it? Some intelligent, apparently honest people would like to blame the assassination on the Mafia, or the Cubans, or even the Russians. But this story of the President's body throws all those theories out of the window, doesn't it? I mean, after the President's murder, we would imagine that the FBI and Secret Service agents would be under a super heightened state of alert, trying to make up for letting the President die by now at least protecting his body. Who could have penetrated this security in order to steal and mutilate the body of the slain President? Certainly not the Mafia, not the Cubans, not even the Russians. No way. What we have here is proof positive that the investigation of Kennedy's murder was sabotaged by members of his own government at the very highest levels. So what? They covered it up. The cover-up is not the same as murder, is it? Is it? Well, it depends. You see, Lee Harvey Oswald was arrested because he matched a description that went out over the police radio. But nobody claims to have seen the president's killers, and so nobody knows where this description of Oswald came from. But never mind, a description of Oswald mysteriously goes out over the police radio, and 20 cops descend on Oswald and arrest him for going into a movie theater without buying a 75-cent ticket. But the police didn't have any evidence against him. None. I didn't shoot anybody, no, sir. When they finally charged Oswald with the president's murder, it was nearly midnight, and they still had no evidence against him. How did they know at 2 o'clock in the afternoon when they stole the body for the first time? How did they know at 4 o'clock in the afternoon when they stole the body for the second time? The autopsy began at 6 p.m. Dallas time. How did they know, five hours before Oswald was even charged, that they needed to cut up the evidence that Oswald was shot from the front? We don't mean to pressure you, but before we move on, we have to get you to confront this question. How did they know, just hours after the assassination, that it was impossible to have a real investigation and to catch the real killers? How did they know? How could they have known? The men who stole Kennedy's body and mutilated it were accessories before the fact. They had to have been accessories to have acted so swiftly and so decisively and so brutally. They were guilty of conspiracy to murder. They were in on the assassination, part of the operation from the beginning. They were powerful men to be able to do what they did and get away with it. Who had such power? It's a short list, isn't it? We now have some background to take up the momentous question of who shot President Kennedy. This question is easier to answer than you might think. Spotlight Magazine published an article citing a memo written by this man, former CIA Director Richard Helms, which places this man, an admitted CIA assassin, in Dallas on the day that Kennedy was murdered. The memo says, Hunt was in Dallas the day the President was murdered and was involved in the conspiracy to kill Kennedy. Hunt sued Spotlight Magazine for slander and had his day in court. Hunt's explanation of where he was on the day that Kennedy was murdered is a disaster of impossible lies. Over the years, Hunt has given five different explanations of where he was on the day that Kennedy was murdered. Now, the jury found the magazine innocent of slander. Just think for a minute about what that means. The magazine had written that, quote, Hunt was in Dallas the day the president was murdered and was involved in the conspiracy to kill Kennedy, unquote. The jury said publicly that they found that what the magazine had written about Hunt was true. 
Essentially, they found Hunt guilty of the murder of President Kennedy. Somehow, that story failed to make the papers. But there's at least one story from this trial that should be told. During the trial, the former head of CIA, Richard Helms, testified that Marita Lorenz was a CIA agent known to him and working for them. Her role in a CIA plot to assassinate Castro was the plot of a movie. During the court proceedings, Ms. Lorenz testified that she was part of the CIA's Operation 40, which carried out terrorist raids against Cuba from 1960 to 1963. During November of 1963, she was working with this man, CIA operative Frank Sturgis. She testified that one day Sturgis came and told her to pack her bags, that they were going on a mission. A short time later, she drove to a motel in Dallas with Sturgis in two station wagons full of men and guns. There was a knock at the door, and E. Howard Hunt came in and began passing out maps and money. This was clearly shaping up as an attack not upon Cuba, but upon Americans on American soil. Lorenz told Sturgis, I'm getting the hell out of here, and took a cab to the airport and flew back to Miami. The next day, President Kennedy was murdered. Sturgis returned later, saying, You should have been there. We made history. You missed the really big one. We killed the president. Again, after listening to all the testimony in the trial, the jury found that Spotlight magazine did not slander Hunt when Spotlight printed an article saying that Hunt had murdered John Kennedy. But Hunt did not have the ability to steal the body from the Dallas coroner, or to steal it again from the Secret Service, and remove it from its coffin and mutilate it, and then return it without attracting public attention, and he didn't have the ability to get all the media to lie about it. The single bullet theory remains intact. For the next 40 years. What we will do is demonstrate that those theories are wrong. The theft of the body, for example, could only have been carried out by the most powerful devils in the world. Devils so powerful, we would recognize their names if we heard them. Can we connect Hunt to any major league devils? Former President Richard Nixon might be a good place to start. Even though he's not generally regarded as an expert at handling guns, he is portrayed in popular American culture as being a slave to the devil. Nixon chose E. Howard Hunt to lead his private White House goon squad, the so-called Plumbers Unit. Hunt became famous as the head of the Watergate burglars. But after his arrest for breaking into the Watergate Hotel, while he was sitting in jail, Hunt suddenly began sending messages to Nixon that he needed two million dollars to keep his mouth shut. At the same time, Hunt started talking to reporters, saying that he was a CIA assassin. To the thousands of people who believed that the CIA had killed Kennedy, this was earth-shaking news. Hunt was threatening to tell about the Kennedy assassination if Nixon didn't get him the hell out of jail and get him two million dollars. Nixon sent word to the FBI director that he had to stop investigating Hunt's activities in Mexico. In Mexico, Hunt had been using this man to launder the money that was being supplied by this man. Nixon said that the FBI investigation would threaten to uncover the whole Bay of Pigs thing. The whole Bay of Pigs thing? What is that supposed to mean? Bob Haldeman was Nixon's chief of staff and closest advisor. He wrote, it seems that in all those references to the Bay of Pigs, he was actually referring to the Kennedy assassination. Nixon was forced to resign based upon the single charge that he tried to stop the FBI from investigating Hunt. And, according to Haldeman, Nixon told the FBI that investigating Hunt would uncover the whole Kennedy assassination thing. But how did Nixon know that Hunt was involved? And if he did know, why did he hire him? And why should Nixon care what Hunt said or what the FBI found out about the Kennedy assassination unless he was involved? Was Nixon involved in the Kennedy assassination? One of the most stunning revelations to be uncovered about Nixon recently is this little gem. It seems that Jack Ruby, the mafia thug who shot Oswald, who was spotted by a Dallas reporter in Parkland Hospital in the area where the magic bullet was found on the wrong stretcher, was working for Congressman Richard Nixon in 1947. Nixon admits that he was in Dallas the day that Kennedy was murdered. Well, actually, he forgot that he was in Dallas the first time he was asked about it by the FBI, but
but they reminded him, and then he admitted that he was in Dallas. So what? So what is that? Just as with September 11th, everyone who was alive has a vivid memory of where they were and what they were doing the moment they heard the news. You remember where you were the moment you first heard the news that the World Trade Center had come down, and everyone, even little kids like I was at the time, have a clear recollection of where we were when we heard the news that the president had been shot. Well, almost everyone remembers. It seems that Nixon, like Hunt, can't remember what he was doing the day that Kennedy was murdered. You see, in 1964, he told Reader's Digest, I boarded a plane from Dallas to New York. I hailed a cab. We were waiting for the light to change when a man ran over from the street corner and said that the president had just been shot in Dallas. This is the way I heard the news. However, exactly nine years later, he told Esquire magazine, On arrival in New York, we caught a cab and headed for the city. A woman came out of her house screaming and crying. She told us that John Kennedy had just been shot in Dallas. Why does Nixon remember two different versions of how he found out that Kennedy was dead? Perhaps, like Hunt, he can't tell the truth about where he was and what he was doing, and we may never get a clear picture of his activities that day. But it is clear that he had a close relationship with another suspect in this case. As president, he shocked political observers by bringing in a Democrat to be his Secretary of the Treasury the Texas Democrat, who was sitting in front of Kennedy when his brains were blown out, who sat holding his Stetson, looking calmly forward and pretending that nothing was going on, when he says that he had just heard at that very moment what he clearly recognized as a rifle shot, who held Kennedy's hand and led him into the killing zone, John Connolly, the Democratic governor of Texas. But Nixon wasn't a powerful devil in 1963. In fact, he had quit politics completely after losing the election in 1960 to Kennedy and then losing the election for governor of California in 62. So, he was taking orders in 1963, the day Kennedy was shot, from much bigger devils. Can we name them? We need a little bit of historical background to understand who these really big devils are before going on. America is home to some of the most brutally vicious racist monsters in all of history. American slave owners invented state-sponsored racism. And the wars of extermination against the first Americans killed a higher percentage of their race than Hitler's attempt to exterminate the Jews. It should come as no surprise, then, that the most powerful families in this country, the Fords, the Harrimans, the DuPonts, and especially the Rockefellers supported racism, genocide, and Hitler from the very beginning. This is J. Edgar Hoover, the head of the FBI for nearly 40 years. Since his death, he has been exposed as having been gay and a cross-dresser. He has been criticized for a long time for being a racist, but you have to admire his skills as an investigator. Hoover investigated the Nazi connections of all these people and brought actions against them. The Rockefellers and DuPonts were charged with secretly giving vital formulas for synthetic gasoline and synthetic rubber to the Germans during wartime. This was and is a huge deal. Without gasoline for their planes or rubber for the tires of their trucks, the Nazis absolutely could not have made war. This incredible destruction, an estimated 100 million people dead, would have been utterly impossible without the help of these American Nazis, the DuPonts and the Rockefellers, who not only gave the German Nazis these vital formulas, they actually tried to hide these formulas from the United States. That bears repeating. These American Nazis gave militarily vital formulas to the German Nazis, while they tried to hide these same vital secret formulas from the U.S. military. And Hoover caught them. Of course, they were never arrested, much less prosecuted. Their servants were hauled in front of Congress and called a lot of names and threatened with prison, and then everyone went back to the business of making millions of dollars off of the war. But the details are absolutely fascinating, and we'll take a minute to look at one case. During his search for American Nazis, Hoover also investigated the Nazi connections of Union Bank of New York, 
and in 1942, the year the U.S. entered the war, the bank was seized as a Nazi asset. Prescott Bush, the grandfather of little George Bush, was the director and executive officer of that bank. And when the U.S. grabbed the bank, he protested. He said, wait a minute, that's my bank. Hoover said, that's right, no mistake, you're a Nazi, you run a Nazi bank. Now, let's not exaggerate. You run a bank for the Nazis, they tell you what to do, you do it. Does that make you a Nazi? Just because you follow their orders? Well, yes, it kind of does, doesn't it? And besides, Prescott didn't live in Germany, he lived in America. He had a choice. There were lots of other jobs and other people he could have worked for. He freely chose to work for these Nazis. But maybe the Germans he was working for were just opportunistic businessmen, you know, just out to make a buck. Well, no doubt they were out to make a buck. But the principal German business partner in the Union Bank was the most infamous Nazi financier, Fritz Tyson, an early enthusiastic and vitally important supporter of Hitler's, providing key money in the earliest days of the party. He is probably the most important financial supporter of Hitler's that we know about. But the Bush family didn't need Germans to teach them about racism. The Bushes are descended from slave owners, for crying out loud. And they were enormously active in the eugenics movement in this country, trying to keep the undesirable, dirty races out of America, like the Irish, the Chinese, the Italians, and the Jews. No, Prescott comes from a long and proud line of vicious racists. So Hoover knew what he was talking about. Prescott Bush was a Nazi's Nazi. This is going to be extremely important later on, so please make a note to yourself. Hoover knew that the Bushes were Nazis. Yeah, yeah, enough with the Bush bashing. What does any of this have to do with the Kennedy assassination? Well, Prescott Bush, little George Bush's grandfather, was a co-director of this Nazi bank with this Nazi, Averill Harriman, his boss. Prescott Bush was also a full partner in Brown Brothers Harriman. They were the closest of business associates. Remember the trial of E. Howard Hunt, where the jury found Hunt guilty of the murder of President Kennedy? During this trial, Hunt testified that immediately after World War II, he was in Paris, working directly for Averill Harriman, reporting directly on a daily basis to his boss. Now, ask yourself, how likely is it that two of Harriman's closest business associates never met each other, never had anything to do with each other? It's possible, but it's not likely. So there's a connection, two degrees of separation, between little George's grandfather and an established Kennedy assassin. We saw a moment ago that in 1942, Hoover forced Prescott Bush to give up his active political support for his favorite young politician, Adolf Hitler. However, four short years later, Prescott found another young man to sponsor in politics, Nixon, who was documented as employing Jack Ruby a year after this photo was taken. Nixon, who hired Hunt, who hired Connolly, was created and sponsored from the very beginning by Prescott Bush. Now, you look at this picture. Do these two look like equals, or does one look like the boss and the other look like the servant? Despite his near arrest as a Nazi a few years before, in this picture Prescott was now a senator. That's juice. And with his help, Richard Nixon, the poor grocer's son, had become vice president. But not for long, remember, he was about to lose to Kennedy. Now, you remember, we posed the problem a minute ago, that while circumstantial evidence powerfully suggests that Nixon was involved somehow in the Kennedy assassination, the circumstantial evidence does not suggest that Nixon was a powerful devil in 1963 when Kennedy was murdered. He was just one of a multitude of puppets, secret servicemen, FBI, CIA operatives, who participated in the assassination, all relatively powerless, getting their strings pulled. And we wondered, who was pulling Nixon's strings? Perhaps now we have an insight into who was pulling Nixon's strings. So, what do you think of the case so far? We've established Hunt as a first-level supervisor of the assassins. He is connected to Prescott Bush through Harriman. And he is also connected to Prescott through Nixon. It's taken me 40 years to develop this perspective, but at this point, I really view the Kennedy assassination as a continuation of World War II. Remember, the American Nazis didn't lose the war, they won. 
Then they tricked Truman into giving them complete control of the CIA. They were able to work around Eisenhower. But Nixon was their boy. He was supposed to have won the election in 1960, not Kennedy. He would have led a massive invasion of Cuba at the Bay of Pigs, and he would have had 100,000 troops in Vietnam by 1963. But Kennedy was ruining all of that. Well, hell, since World War II, these Nazis had already killed our Benz, the democratically elected president of Guatemala, Patrice Lumumba, the democratically elected president of Congo, and Mossadegh, the democratically elected president of Iran. Killing that stinking Irishman, Kennedy, would just be natural, wouldn't it? The chicken's coming home to roost, right? What do you think? Makes sense? Well, I think it gives us some of the background necessary for a genuinely deep understanding of who killed John Kennedy. It will probably surprise you to learn that very early on, many key people knew that the CIA, through its Cuban and Mafia operatives, had killed the president. It was not a very well-kept secret. Just one example is that Pulitzer Prize-winning reporter Haynes Johnson says that he was in the room when Robert Kennedy, on the afternoon of the murder, blamed the assassination on the CIA and their anti-Castro Cubans. And there's reason to think that Hoover also knew most of the details of the assassination even before it happened. In 1960, three years before the assassination, Hoover himself wrote a memo about Lee Harvey Oswald's involvement with the CIA. Three years before the assassination, Oswald was on Hoover's personal radar as being CIA involved. Just amazing! And, apparently, just the beginning of a long and beautiful relationship between Hoover and Oswald. You see, at the opening session of the Warren Commission's official investigation into the Kennedy assassination, this man, the Attorney General of the state of Texas, Wagoner Carr, calls up the commissioners and says he thinks, Y'all ought to know your boy Lee Oswald was working for the FBI on the payroll getting $200 a month with the ID number S-179. The commissioners decided not to even ask Hoover about it. Why? My guess is they were scared to death he might admit his relationship with Oswald. And there's powerful evidence that Oswald was working for the FBI, spying for them on the CIA. In 1963, Kennedy called in Hoover and ordered him to locate the secret training camps that the CIA was using to train their anti-Castro Cubans for terrorist raids against Cuba. He didn't want another missile crisis. The camps were so secret not even the president knew the location. But Kennedy ordered Hoover to find them and to shut them down. And Delphine Roberts, a secretary who helped run the CIA's camp at Lake Pontchartrain, Louisiana, told the Warren Commission she saw Lee Harvey Oswald at the camp just days before the FBI raided it and seized all the weapons and shut it down. Oswald's closest known associate in New Orleans worked at this garage, where Oswald used to hang out with him. This witness told the Warren Commission that he saw Oswald exchange envelopes outside the garage with men that he took to be FBI agents. And you remember Marita Lorenz. She says Oswald was at the meeting in Dallas the day before the assassination when Hunt walked in and started passing out maps and money. William Walters, a clerk at the FBI, produced a memo from Hoover warning of a coming assassination attempt on November 22nd in Dallas. Hoover knew. These people have given me a hearing without legal representation or anything. I didn't shoot anybody, no, sir. And if Oswald was his informant, he knew plenty. Remember, too, Hoover knew that the Bushes were Nazis. He knew that Prescott Bush was a frontline operative for the biggest Nazis on the planet. These Nazis were not Hoover's friends. He had busted them in 1942, and now they had set up his most important undercover informant for the murder of the president. But so now, with all that in mind, look at this bombshell that Hoover dropped on the Bushes five days after the assassination. It was released by the FBI in 1977, hidden under a pile 100,000 pages high. It took 15 years for researchers to find it. It was never classified and would have been widely distributed, so Hoover's not speaking frankly here. We have to read between the lines. It's signed by J. Edgar Hoover himself, and the title is Assassination of President John F. Kennedy. That's a big hint, I think, as to what the memo is about. It says that it's about a meeting that took place between the FBI and the CIA the day after the assassination. 
The memo says that the FBI had been investigating a possible threat from what Hoover calls a misguided anti-Castro group. A misguided anti-Castro group. The memo doesn't say that members of some misguided anti-Castro group killed Kennedy, but Hoover undoubtedly knew that they had. What the memo does do is name Mr. George Bush of the Central Intelligence Agency as a CIA officer associated with the CIA's misguided anti-Castro groups. It suggests that Bush was the person at the CIA responsible for these people. And, in stark black and white, it says that the CIA sent Mr. George Bush to Washington the day after the assassination to answer for them, when the FBI had questions about the activities of some misguided anti-Castro group. The memo was a scandal when it was made public in 1988, because it says that George Bush was in the CIA in 1963, it means that Bush lied, committed perjury, when he told the Senate, under oath, that he had no CIA experience before becoming director in 1974. It means that he was in the CIA when he ran for Senate and lost in 1964, and when he ran for Senate and lost in 1970. And it means that he was in the CIA when Nixon brought Bush into the White House, trailing E. Howard Hunt behind him. Bush was first confronted with his memo in 1992, and he had a chance to respond to it. Bush claimed that the memo must be talking about another George Bush working at CIA because it couldn't be talking about him, because he had never been in the CIA. Oh, except for that time in 1974 when he was director of CIA. Should we believe him? Let's make clear what we're talking about here. The George Bush of this memo, who received the FBI's report on misguided anti-Castro Cubans, was an officer in the CIA and obviously a supervisor of the CIA's misguided Cuban operations. We've not only seen the CIA and their misguided Cubans implicated in the Kennedy assassination, but we've seen that Hoover knew that they were involved when he wrote this memo. This is some important stuff, eh? The George Bush of this memo is essentially being named by Hoover as being directly implicated in the assassination. It makes a huge difference if this was our George Bush or some other George Bush. But how can we know? Well, come on, it's basic stuff. Is there any corroboration? Is there any other evidence besides this memo to show whether Bush was in the CIA at this time or shows whether Bush was supervising anti-Castro Cubans? We'll start by looking at Bush's connections. A quick look at Alan Dulles may help us understand the importance of connections. Dulles worked closely with Nazi bankers during World War II. That somehow qualified him to become the director of the newly formed Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA. He was the architect of the Bay of Pigs invasion of Cuba. When he launched the invasion against Kennedy's orders, of course Kennedy fired him. So thinking people were shocked when he was virtually put in charge of the investigation of Kennedy's murder, the Warren Commission. Because he was so widely suspected to have been the leader of the assassins. But he had been fired. He was no longer the head of CIA. How could he lead anything? Because the organizing principle of secret work is that you trust only the people known to you personally and that are connected to you personally. The CIA is not so much an organization as a community. So that it hardly mattered that Kennedy had fired Dulles. The men who were loyal to Dulles, who knew him and trusted him, continued to trust and obey. In fact, Dulles stood at the center of a group of men who not only had the motive to kill the president, but who alone had the ability to steal the body from the Dallas coroner, to steal it from the Secret Service and mutilate it and return it, and to order the media to lie about it for the next 40 years. Was George Bush a member of this community in 1963, as the Hoover memo says? We will never find a CIA document naming the CIA officer who supervised the assassination. That memo doesn't exist. In fact, that person is probably not even listed on the CIA payroll because it's a secret. But what we're looking for is evidence of Bush's presence inside this intelligence community. Did he have close personal ties with these people? That's the real question. Certainly. One of Bush's main ties to this community is the connection between his father and Alan Dulles. In the 1930s and 1940s, Alan Dulles was a close business associate on a first-name basis with both Prescott Bush and Averill Harriman. 
At the end of World War I, before there was a CIA, Prescott worked with Army Intelligence, a forerunner and parallel organization to the CIA. Prescott had the intelligence background, not Dulles, but on paper at least, Dulles was head of the CIA. Through Prescott's closest associate, Averill Harriman, Prescott is also tied to Richard Bissell, the CIA director of operations for the Bay of Pigs invasion, who was also fired by Kennedy. Bissell, like Hunt, also worked for Averill Harriman for 10 years before joining the CIA. In 1962, the year before Kennedy was murdered, Prescott also partnered with William Casey, who would become the CIA director under Reagan. At that time, Kennedy was moving to dismantle the CIA. Prescott and Casey together founded the National Strategy Information Center to directly fight against Kennedy's efforts. Now, let's pause for a moment to savor this picture, if you will. We're looking at Prescott, teamed up with a man who would become one of the most notorious law-breaking CIA chiefs in history. Under Reagan, Casey was at the epicenter of the October Surprise slash Iran-Contra slash crack cocaine scandal. And a year before the assassination, these two formed this National Strategy Information Center to organize opposition to Kennedy's efforts to reduce the power of the CIA. To organize opposition. Think for a moment, what does that mean, to organize opposition? It means that you meet with all the most powerful people you can find, other people who, like you, want to stop Kennedy. And you try to come up with plans to stop him. That's what organizing opposition means, isn't it? The killers would be the most natural candidates for membership in Prescott's organization. Now, this is only circumstantial evidence, but it is powerful circumstantial evidence. And if we pause for another moment to catch up on our scorekeeping, we will see that it has already been shown that Prescott did in fact surround himself with people, including his son, who were directly connected to the killers. He was closely connected to Harriman, who was closely connected to Hunt, a second-degree connection. He was closely connected to Nixon, who was closely connected to Hunt, another second-degree connection. Hunt was in the CIA. That means he also worked for Dulles. So, add one more second-degree connection with Hunt. And, Hunt was supervised by Richard Bissell at the Bay of Pigs. So, add a third-degree connection with Hunt. And, of course, we have the Hoover Memo, which says, in black and white, in so many words, that there is a direct, first-degree connection between Prescott's son, George Bush, and the misguided anti-Castro Cubans, who were famously supervised directly by E. Howard Hunt. But at the center of Bush's connections to the world of secret murder and filth is his membership in the Society of Skull and Bones, a secret Yale fraternity famous for its celebration of racism, robbery, and death. This tomb is where they meet twice a week to engage in black rituals involving skulls, candles, and ceremonial group masturbation. I guess it's supposed to be kind of a gay group marriage thing. Brothers under the skin is how the Bonesmen themselves describe their relationship. Their graduates are a powerful bunch of devils. Averill Harriman and Prescott Bush were Bonesmen. George Herbert Walker Bush was a Bonesman, and so was his uncle, the arch-racist George Herbert Walker. Robert Lovett, architect of the CIA, was a Bonesman, selected for membership by Prescott himself. F. Truby Davison was also selected for membership in 1918, the year that Prescott did the picking. Davison was in charge of hiring for the CIA in 1948, the year that George Herbert Walker Bush left Yale in search of a job. Davison had a son, Endicott Peabody Davison. Endicott was skull and bones, class of 48, making him brother under the skin to George Herbert Walker Bush. He's also the Bush family lawyer. Okay, they're weird and creepy. Or not. Maybe in a thousand years, this group masturbation thing will be a mainstream practice in group therapy. I don't know. Maybe they don't do it anymore. Maybe they never did it. I don't really care. It's not the point. The point is that no one will dispute the fact that Skull and Bones is an intimate organization whose members have very close relationships with each other, who work with each other throughout the rest of their lives, and who are very loyal to each other. Prescott chose Truby. He had a close relationship with him. Truby went on to become the head of hiring for CIA. George Sr. was a brother under the skin to Truby's son. 
George Sr. had a close, even intimate relationship with the son of the head of hiring for CIA. Their fathers had a close, even intimate relationship. What we are supposed to be doing here is trying to evaluate this message from Hoover. We are trying to judge the likelihood that this memo, referring to a CIA supervisor of anti-Castro Cubans named George Bush, is referring to our George Bush. Certainly, all this evidence about skull and bones and the CIA makes it certainly appear very possible, even likely. In a world where personal connection is everything, no one could possibly have a closer personal relationship to the head of hiring for CIA than George Herbert Walker Bush. Bush's first job on leaving Skull and Bones was to work for Neil Mallon, brother under the skin to Prescott, class of 1918. In a letter to White House aide C.D. Jackson dated March 26th of 1953, now Senator Prescott Bush described Neil Mallon as a very old and dear friend. I might say that Neil Mallon is well known to Alan Dulles and has tried to be helpful to him at that agency especially in the procurement of individuals to serve in that important agency. So, George went from skull and bones, he went directly from being a brother under the skin to the son of the head of hiring for CIA, to working for a recruiter for CIA. You couldn't ask for more powerful evidence that our George Bush was in the CIA when Hoover said that he was, but you can get it. This letter records a meeting between Prescott Bush, George's CIA-promoting father, Neil Mallon, the CIA recruiter, and Alan Dulles, the director of CIA, to discuss, quote, our pilot project in the Caribbean, unquote. Now, let that sink in for a moment. Here you have the two most important men in George's future professional life, his father, Prescott, and the man who trained George in the oil business, Neil Mallon, meeting with the head of the CIA in order to coordinate with the CIA their future plans in the Caribbean. Prescott and Neil Mallon's plans had George at their center. George was their pilot project in the Caribbean. The terrorist raids of Operation 40 involving Hunt, Sturgis, and Marita Lorenz were the CIA's private project in the Caribbean. This letter, then, not only ties George to the CIA, corroborating the Hoover memo on that point, it not only ties George's future oil company to the CIA's plans in the Caribbean, but it thereby ties George to the CIA's misguided anti-Castro groups mentioned in the Hoover Memo, which was the CIA's pilot project in the Caribbean. And, a short time after this meeting, at the moment that Alan Dulles began implementing his plan for the CIA invasion of Cuba at the Bay of Pigs, Bush began his independent business career as the sole owner of Zapata Offshore Oil. Zapata Offshore's oil rigs just happened to be positioned right in the middle of CIA operations in the area 30 miles north of Cuba near Quay Sal, an island used by the CIA for supplying the various terrorist raids of Operation 40, Operation Mongoose, Alpha 66, and the rest of these murderers against Cuba. Let me repeat that. Bush left his job, being trained in the oil business by a CIA recruiter, and went to work on his own, setting up shop right in the middle of the CIA's misguided anti-Castro-Cuban operations. Really, that should sort of settle the question. Three pieces of undisputed, solid evidence that our George Bush was working for the CIA in the Caribbean. And this is the big stuff. But there's more. The assassins of Operation 40, the misguided anti-Castro Cubans of the Hoover Memo, were supervised on the front lines by E. Howard Hunt. Hunt got this job because he was previously a first-level supervisor of the Bay of Pigs invasion. The secret code name for the Bay of Pigs invasion was Operation Zapata. Operation Zapata? Zapata offshore? Now, you could fairly ask what kind of idiot would give a secret operation a secret code name and name it after his own company that was operating in the area. What kind of idiot? George Bush, that's what kind of idiot. In World War II, Bush named his plane after his wife, the Barbara II. When this plane was shot down, what do you suppose he named his next plane? Did you guess it? The Barbara III. While the CIA was preparing for the Bay of Pigs invasion, the CIA ordered a large ship from the Navy to carry guns and tanks and men to the Bay of Pigs invasion. 
But no one was supposed to know that this was a U.S. Navy ship. The world was supposed to believe that these were just private citizens of Cuba. So it was necessary to disguise the ship and to change the name. The name was changed to the Barbara. Now, this is not a big deal. It's a small deal. But it's there. Bush has a habit of naming things in his military career after things in his personal life. He named two planes after his wife, and one of the three CIA ships at the Bay of Pigs was renamed the Barbara. It's a small piece that just happens to fit perfectly with the bigger picture of Bush as a CIA officer working with anti-Castro Cuban terrorists. This same habit of naming things in his military career after things in his personal life links Bush's oil company, Zapata Offshore, to Operation Zapata and to the anti-Castro Cuban terrorists. But again, let's not overemphasize this name stuff. Finding the name of Bush's wife on a CIA supply ship or finding the code name for the Bay of Pigs invasion on his oil company is a small but clear detail of this much bigger picture. The big picture shows us that at the same time that Hunt moved from working inside Harriman's office to go to the CIA where he supervised at the CIA's invasion of Cuba, at the same time that Richard Bissell moved from working inside Harriman's office to go to work for the CIA where he became the director of planning for the Bay of Pigs operations, at the very same time, the oldest son of Harriman's closest associate went to work in the exact same outdoor office where Hunt and Bissell were now operating. Hoover's memo names George Bush as a CIA supervisor of the Bay of Pigs invaders, the anti-Castro Cubans. The evidence for this is simply overwhelming. There can be no reasonable doubt about this connection. George Bush was working for the CIA, assisting their operations at the Bay of Pigs, working for Bissell, working with Hunt, working with Sturgis, supervising the CIA's misguided anti-Castro Cuban groups. His supervision of Hunt and the others at the Bay of Pigs is a key piece of evidence linking him to the assassination. But it is not Bush's only connection to Hunt and the other suspects. After Bush got beaten up, losing two elections for Senate, Nixon rescued him from defeat and humiliation by bringing him into the White House trailing E. Howard Hunt behind him. Haldeman says no one seems to know who brought Hunt into the White House. But it's not hard to figure out, because not only did Hunt and Bush come to work in the White House at exactly the same time, but no one else in the White House had any connections to CIA operations. No one had any connections. While Bush, on the other hand, was directly involved in the same CIA operations in the same area at the same time that Hunt was. And there's more to this story. Nixon's chief of staff says that everyone was astonished, flabbergasted, in 1970, the day that Nixon announced that he was bringing John Connolly into the White House as his Secretary of the Treasury. No one understood the connection between these two, one the leader of the Republican Party and the other the number two Texas Democrat. Haldeman says, however, that Connolly insisted that before they could hire him, they first had to get a White House job for Bush. Why? What is their relationship? What does Bush have to say about it in his autobiography? Not a word. Not one. If he and Connolly ever spoke in their lives, Bush doesn't mention it. How can you possibly explain the connection between these people? Do these men have anything in common? The answer is either no, they all came together in 1970 for no apparent reason, or the answer is this one, they all met on the same road to power. And there's more to the Nixon-Bush-Hunt connection than that they all came together at the same time in the same place. Remember when Hunt was sitting in jail demanding that Nixon pay him $2 million in hush money or he'd start talking? Hunt got paid. The money came from this man, Bill Leidke. Bush's oldest, closest, and most important business partner. Leitke helped Bush found Zapata Offshore. Then, in 1959, when the CIA needed the company, Leitke handed the company to Bush, made Bush the sole owner so that Bush could carry out secret operations without any outside observers getting in the way. The fact that Bush's closest business partner paid Hunt the $2 million is just one more connection between Hunt and Bush. But wait! There's more. Remember this man? Leitke's money actually went to him, Ramon Rodriguez. He was a CIA-trained money launderer, working in a Mexican bank 
and he wrote the actual checks that Hunt received. Uh, I made payments for the uh, Watergate burglars. Twelve years later, in 1984, he was working as a money launderer for the main Colombian drug cartel when Vice President Bush sent this man to ask him for $10 million to help pay for the illegal terrorist war Bush was waging against the people of Nicaragua. Well, the only government uh, mention that he made was Vice President Bush. The request for the contribution made a lot more sense because Felix was reporting to George Bush. Here you have a CIA guy reporting to the old boss. Now, how did Bush know this man? How did he know he had $10 million, and how did he know he would pay it? All good questions. Whatever the answer, the connection is still there. Bush is connected to him by this incident, and through him, Bush again is connected to Hunt. Two more connections between Bush and Hunt. It's starting to get ridiculous. Hunt's mother is not so thoroughly connected to Hunt. And now let's look at Bush's role in the cover-up. In 1975, the Senate Select Committee on Assassinations began to investigate the CIA's role in the Kennedy assassination. And William Colby, the head of the CIA at the time, was cooperating with the committee. It was Colby, obviously, that supplied the committee with the memo, signed by Helms and others, that said that Hunt was in Dallas and was involved in the assassination. Colby was magnificent. Listen to his testimony regarding this assassination weapon that shoots an eye start into the victim, causing a heart attack. Does this pistol uh, fire the dart? Yes, it does, Mr. Chairman. And a special one was developed which potentially would be able to uh, enter the target without perception. But also the toxin itself would not appear in the autopsy? Yes, so that uh, there was no, no way of perceiving that the, uh, the target was hit. The committee members, as you can see, were tickled. Here was a weapon that might be used against any one of them, any time, if they dared to take seriously their duty to serve the American people, instead of the bankers. Colby, apparently, also took this duty seriously. But at the height of the committee's investigation, Nelson Rockefeller was made vice president, and Colby was suddenly fired. And, out of the blue, supposedly with no CIA experience, George Bush Sr. was appointed to take over as director of CIA. Why? What qualified Bush for this job? One thing. Bush could be relied upon better than Colby to cover up the facts of JFK's murder because Bush knew that the trail led straight to him. He had to cover it up, and he did. He ended the CIA's cooperation with the committee and effectively shut down the investigation. But the fact that Bush played this leading role in the cover-up connects him to every person threatened by this investigation. So, there's a ton of evidence that connects George Bush to Kennedy's killers. But now we'll look at a couple of pieces of strange evidence that while they don't connect Bush to the killers, do connect him to the assassination in ways that can only be described as... Weird. This is George de Morenschelt. He was a wealthy, Russian-born, Texas oil man who liked to party with minimum wage clerks. He helped get Oswald a job at the Dallas School Book Depository. Of course he was CIA. It seems that de Morenschelt was not in on the assassination and that he was just following orders when he got Oswald a job at the School Book Depository. Listen to his description of Oswald. He definitely was not an enemy. He was an admirer of President Kennedy. And we, we raised that question several times. He didn't believe Oswald hated Kennedy. This supports the other evidence we've seen that Oswald was in fact an FBI agent who was spying on the CIA for the FBI and who had infiltrated the CIA's misguided anti-Castro Cuban killers. De Morenschelt was planning to tell the congressional investigators what he knew about Oswald and the assassination the night before he was to be questioned by the investigators for the Senate Committee on Assassinations his head was blown off with a shotgun. In his pocket at the time was an address book, and in his address book was this entry, Bush, George H. W., Poppy, his family nickname, 1412 West Ohio, also Zapata Petroleum, Midland. By itself, this proves nothing. Taken in context, however, it is one more amazingly direct connection between Bush and the assassination. 
Okay, it's clear enough. Bush was in the CIA, beyond a doubt. He was connected with the killers, beyond a doubt. But suppose he was one of the good guys at CIA. There are such people. Colby was one. Maybe Bush was like Colby, a good guy who worked with the killers while they were carrying out operations that the president actually had ordered. But someone who the killers had to get rid of when they were committing terrible crimes not approved by the president. Maybe Bush was a good guy, like Fletcher Prouty. The day of the assassination, Prouty, who was the Pentagon's top liaison with the CIA, was sent to the South Pole to babysit some diplomats. Maybe the bad guys sent Bush on vacation the day they killed Kennedy to get him out of the way. Well, this document shows different. This FBI document records that. On the day of the assassination, at 1:45 p.m., one hour and 15 minutes after the shooting, Bush was already involved in trying to misdirect the FBI in their efforts to catch the killers. This document records that Mr. George Bush telephonically furnished the following: that he recalled hearing in recent weeks, the day and source unknown, that one James Parrot had been talking of killing the president when he comes to Houston. Date and source unknown. How could you not remember when or where you heard someone say that he was going to kill the president? It's little wonder then that this FBI agent took time from the busiest day of his career to record this screwy phone call. He wanted to be sure to record the name and occupation of this very suspicious caller, and we see then that Bush was not out of town on vacation. He had not been sent to babysit some penguins at the South Pole. He was actively involved in matters related to the assassination, and. Out of his own mouth, he was in Dallas on the day that Kennedy was killed. When questioned about this FBI document, Bush said that he does not recall making the phone call. Now wait one minute. Everyone in the country can tell you exactly where they were and what they were doing when Kennedy was killed. He was busy calling the FBI to misinform them, but he doesn't remember. His failure to recall such dramatic events puts him into a unique club. Like Nixon and Hunt, he can't seem to remember the events of November 22, 1963. By itself, this claim of Bush's that he cannot remember such a fabulously significant event in his life, with no other evidence, would be terribly incriminating. But this incredible memo does not stand by itself. It's only a small part of this mountain of evidence connecting Bush to every single aspect of the assassination, planning, execution, and cover-up. No one, not Connolly, not Hunt, not Nixon, not Sturgis, not Prescott, not Dulles, no one on the planet could possibly have better credentials as a suspect in the murder of John F. Kennedy than George Herbert Walker Bush. The scale in this case is tipped past a certain critical point. The probability that he was involved is genuinely beyond a reasonable doubt. The Hoover memo is not circumstantial evidence. It is direct eyewitness, smoking gun evidence from the most influential figure in the history of American law enforcement. The rest of the evidence merely provides a context for this memo that makes it impossible to reasonably believe that the former president was not involved in the murder of John Kennedy, acting as a frontline operative for the military-industrial complex, who Kennedy had threatened to destroy just four days before his death. A steady reduction in force. Both nuclear and conventional, until it has abolished all armies and all weapons. There would have been no war in Vietnam. Bush's crime, ripping this man from us and delivering us back into the hands of the military-industrial complex, is one of the great acts of treason in all recorded history. If we could present this evidence to a patriotic jury in Texas, they would certainly give him the death penalty for what he stole from the American people.
when I was just a little fool, my mama sent me off to a place called school. Liked the part about taking a nap, it seemed everything else was a load of crap, no fooling. Taught us George Washington chopped down the cherry tree so we could all have freedom, justice, and liberty. Did I mention Columbus discovered America? Well, I went off to college, and believe it or not, the harder I studied, the dumber I got. Taught us we was all geniuses, folks back home was asses, and elites like us ought to rule the masses. Some schooling. Had to drop out, though. Just couldn't seem to get my shoulders inside my patootie. Got slapped in the face, no it couldn't have been ruder By a friend with a film by a guy named Zapruder Showed Kennedy's brains getting blown out the back Seems the Warren Commission was hooked on crack And the FBI and I And every newspaper and television and radio on God's green earth Well the day JFK got blown away Old George Bush was in the CIA And though we Howard Hunt might have held the gun George Bush Sr. was surely the one who said, do it. I told him again during Watergate, do it. Sold that slogan to Nike. Well, 40 years later, I'm preaching away. Seems my head's still out in the light of day, but Kennedys are still dying, people are still crying, and the TV and the papers and the teachers still lying. Seems it's still pretty dark out in the middle of the day. Even if your head ain't shoved five miles up your patoot. Well, what you gonna do? Seems I can't keep quiet. Can't sit still and I ain't gonna lie and sit back watching while the devil's rule. Might have been once, but I ain't no fool. I'm gonna holler, hey, and I'm gonna beller, hey, and I'm gonna sing you a little song. Go something like this. When I was just a little fool. When I was just a little fool, my mama sent me off to a place called school. Like the part about taking a nap, it seemed everything else was a load of crap, no fooling. Taught us George Washington chopped down the cherry tree so we could all have freedom, justice, and liberty. Did I mention Columbus discovered America? Well, I went off.